Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the director of the U.S. Army Heritage and Education Center, Colonel Jeffrey Mangelsdorf, and the entire staff of the USEC and the Army War College, we welcome you to today's Perspectives in Military History Lecture. Uh, today's lecture is a roundtable event, so we will consist of three parts. Uh, the first part will be a lecture uh, uh, by Colonel Fontenot, and then we will have a panel discussion with uh, three distinguished panelists uh, who all have had a, an interest and impart into uh, the discussion topic today. Uh, we will invite the audience then to participate by offering questions and discussion of their own. Uh, the USEC and the Army War College sponsored the Perspectives in Military History Lecture Series to provide a historical dimension to the exercise of generalship, strategic leadership, and warfighting institutions of land power. Uh, in addition, we would like to extend a warm thank you to the Army Heritage Center Foundation for their support of everything we do here at the AHEC. Uh, please be aware that today's speaker's book is available in the gift shop, and we will be doing a book signing after the program. It will occur up at the gift shop area. Uh, all proceeds from the book sales go to our foundation and expand the campus here at the USAHEC. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm excited to introduce our panelists uh, first this afternoon. Colonel Brian Cook is Director of Theater Strategy at the U.S. Army War College. An armor officer and 1990 West Point graduate, he has served in every leadership position from platoon leader to battalion commander with five combat deployments in support of operations Desert Shield, Desert Storm, Iraqi Freedom, New Dawn, and Enduring Freedom in the 1st Infantry Division, 11th ACR, and 3 Corps. Our next panelist is William T. Johnson, currently Professor of Military History and Strategy and the William L. Stimson Chair of Military Studies at the U.S. Army War College. A career infantry officer, Professor Johnson graduated from the U.S. Military Academy and earned an M.A. and Ph.D. in History from Duke University and graduated from the U.S. Army War College. He is the author of numerous journal articles, book chapters, and monographs. Professor Johnson's most recent work is Origins of the Grand Alliance, Anglo-American Military Collaboration, from the Panay Incident to Pearl Harbor. Our third panelist is Dr. Richard Lackerman, Jr., Colonel Retired U.S. Army and the first Dean School of Strategic Land Power at the U.S. Army War College. He's a political scientist with a doctorate in international relations. He specializes in security studies and has taught academic courses in international relations, American politics, international organizations, theory of war and strategy, strategy policy, and U.S. national security policy. Uh, during more than a 29 years of active military service, he was an Army strategist and field artillery officer. His experience in peace and war include a broad mix of assignments at the tactical, operational, and strategic levels of the armed forces, as well as several assignments in professional military education. And finally, our speaker for this afternoon is Colonel Gregory, Gregory Fontenot. Colonel Fontenot is retired from the U.S. Army after 28 years of service as an armor officer with service in CONUS, Europe, the Balkans, and Southwest Asia. He also taught history at the US, United States Military Academy and served as director of the School of Advanced Military Studies. After retirement, he served as director, training and doctrine commands, wargaming directorate, and later as part of the Army's Red Team Leader course for the University of Foreign Military Studies course. He left civil service in 2013 to pursue his interests in military history writing. Ladies and gentlemen, at this time, I'd like to introduce Colonel Greg Fontenot. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. I took the precaution of, of stacking the audience, uh, since you never know how these things will go. Uh, in the front row, my old division commander, Lieutenant General Tom Rame, U.S. Army, retired. Sir, thanks for coming up. Captain Rick Orth, everybody had a nickname in the battalion. His was Dread Nerd. But when he got in a tank, the nerd effect wore off, and he became uh, an Erwin Rommel kind of guy. You know? Lieutenant Colonel Rabel here uh, reminded me we had uh, dinner together in Vishkov, uh, Czechoslovakia, back in 1995, where I regaled him with stories of plow tanks and the like. And I'm sorry for having done that to you, and then surprisingly, you've come for some more. Jeff Mangelsdorf was my signal officer uh, 20 years ago when I was a commander of battle command training program. Jeff, thanks for coming. And the far back there is Dave Cohill, B-52 navigator of some note, and the uh, air ground control officer for my brigade in, in Bosnia. Henry Gohl is an old friend. If you haven't read uh, Henry's book on Depew or Henry's book on soldier in the Cold War, I wish you would. Hal Nelson's another old friend, former uh, Center of Military History. Kathy Johnson's a very good old friend. She has uh, done her best with Bill. Um, that's all I'm going to say about Bill. Brian Cook is here. Um, I would urge you to read about Brian Cook. Seems like most of the time we were in the desert, he was concerned about his stomach. 
And when was he going to get his next meal, and was it going to be any good? Now, I got to tell you, that's an important consideration in combat because we were hungry all the time. And it didn't matter what you ate, everybody lost 25 or 30 pounds. In my outfit, we called the Dreadnought Desert Diet Program because as soon as you got over there, just the sheer exhaustion would, would peel, the, peel the weight off. So we're going to talk about Desert Storm today and try to put it in some context. Um, General uh, Rain was saying that there were some anomalous things about Desert Storm, one of which was, as Secretary of State Baker put it, a more prudent despot would have waited uh, to attack. And he's right. Uh, if, uh, if Brother Saddam had waited a year or two, we wouldn't have been able to mount the kind of effort uh, that we mounted in, uh, in Desert Storm. The other thing, though, because of the anomalies, that is one. A second anomaly is it was the optimal place for air land battle doctrine and for the army of the late Cold War to fight. And we got to fight against the B team or the C team, depending on your point of view. But there are some things about it that bear uh, recollection and thinking about. I would argue that it's actually the Forgotten War. The Korean War, which was the Forgotten War, has gotten some attention finally, and we've thought about it. But Desert Storm, you know, the view has been, there's nothing to see here, move along. And we had all the hubris and arrogance associated with the end of the Cold War, strategic choices for which we may be paying for uh, a, a debt we may not be able, in fact, to pay. And I would argue there's plenty to learn from Desert Storm, and I hope to share what I think some of those things are with you today. Uh, strategic choices matter, as my friend Bill Johnson and Brian Cook, both of my friends will tell you. Uh, John Keegan's 60, first 60 pages of Face of Battle still matter. He concluded after uh, years of teaching at Sandhurst uh, that he had no idea what a battle could be like, yet one of his jobs was to teach young officers what war might be like. So one of the things I try to do here is address the face of battle to the extent possible for that fight. Last but not least in, in general themes is the U.S. Army uh, speak glibly these days about uh, expeditionary operations without thinking very seriously about what that means. And if you want to understand expeditionary operations, the first thing you should do is go on the internet and look up Civil Reserve Air Fleet. And then right after that, look up Ready Reserve Fleet or Fast Sea Lift and see what our capacity is. Because I will tell you, ladies and gentlemen, if it's not haze gray and underway, we don't care. We cannot operate expeditionary warfare without maritime power and significant uh, strategic theater lift, uh, strategic and theater lift. So now without further ado, um, if I can figure out how to work this thing, I'm going to kind of go through some charts. Wait a minute, that's a pointer. Ah, so the Army from 70 to 90. So if you, if you buy this book, you've got to understand nobody gets shot at till chapter 6. <laughs> and so if that, if that really alarms you, then you know, maybe it's not the book for you. Though I hasten to add, I think probably it is the book for you. Please buy 9 or 10 because, hey, I'm a starving artist and I can use the, uh, the, the proceeds. But what this first couple of chapters does is get you through the transition of the U.S. Army post-Vietnam with all that that meant up to 1990. And there are significant and fundamental changes. It is, for example, this month is um, uh, Women's History Month. The first two women assigned to the 1st Infantry Division were a young woman named PFC Connie Kalvik, who was brought in to be a buddy to 2nd Lieutenant Eugenia Thornton. The very first two women came in 1973. Uh, there had been no preparation for them, so they showed up to their first field event. They didn't know how to put their canteen belt together or the load-bearing equipment. They both had shoulder-length hair with a helmet on top. And they were the object of considerable interest from the Secretary of Defense to the premier of, uh, or the president of Germany, all of whom went to meet them. But two years later, we had hundreds of women in the unit. And by 1990, when my unit crossed the line of departure with 1,010 soldiers, one of them was a female. Say, so, what, well, women don't belong in close combat. Well, apparently she didn't get the memo because she crossed the line of departure with all of us. So integrating women, revising officer education on the end of the war, uh, some of you may have heard of Lieutenant General uh, uh, Wally Elmer, who was uh, the guy that briefed the RETO study, the problems that we had with leadership in Vietnam, and the education system was going to be altered to change that. They also established a non-commissioned officer education program, the notion being learn by doing is not enough. We have an obligation to take the time to educate our non-commissioned officers. And I'll let you see the rest of it. Now, one of the things I do want to say is, General Westmoreland gets 
pretty much reviled by about every history you read. But I came away from reading, doing the research on this, convinced that he was a very good chief of staff of the Army. Maybe he wasn't the right guy in Vietnam. I don't know. That's not what my research is. But he anticipated the volunteer army. So the first thing he did, we came home in June of 69, is by the end, middle of the summer of 69, he had organized a special assistant for the modern volunteer army. The volunteer army didn't become a national issue until November of that year when President Richard Nixon made that a campaign platform. So what you see is the army for once got ahead of the curve. And they made decisions. They weren't social justice decisions. They were business decisions. If you're going to have a volunteer army, what does that mean? That means you have to be able to recruit. You aren't going to get McNamara's 100,000 showing up at the door. And you really don't want those 100,000. You want 100,000 capable people. He could not afford, in his mind, not to have women serve. Interestingly enough, the chief objection to that came from the Women's Army Corps. And you say, well, why would they do that? Because they would lose the core. And change is always difficult. But in the end, uh, Mildred Bailey and a couple of other women who were involved in that took, took the right step and say the moral obligation here is to do what's right for the Army. And that, in the, as a consequence of doing that, will have done what's right for women in the Army. So that's an important part of the story. And he did a lot of other things. We talk about Depew. And I told you, Henry Gold's written a great book about Depew. But Depew wouldn't have been C.G. Tradock if it hadn't been for Westmoreland. Westmoreland had one fantastic trait, as he chose good people around him, in my opinion. And when we do go to the modern volunteer army, it's different than being drafted. So when you were a draftee soldier, and some of us served in that army, you worked Saturday till 1 o'clock if you were a good boy. And if you weren't a good boy, you worked the rest of the weekend. But if you were a good boy, you got off. I remember the first time I got to do that, I got my khakis got my black shoes on, and I took a ride in the shuttle to the PX and had a Coke. Well, I was pretty excited. You know, I was really, wow, I'm not in the barracks. But, you know, when you do this with the volunteer army, you aren't going to treat them like we were treated, you know, convicts, so to speak. They even tell you what time you had to be in bed. In fact, Rick's dad gave uh, Colonel Billy Murphy, uh, our brigade, one of our brigade commanders, uh, just before Desert Storm, Billy got a, an Article 15 from Rick's dad for overstaying bed check or something, I forget what it was. But in those days, draftees did exactly what they were told when they were told. They did kitchen police. They did a lot of things that had nothing to do with soldiering. Modern Volunteer Army worked to change that, but it didn't change the pay. So if you read the book, you'll find that soldiers and their families were on WIC and food stamps uh, to make ends meet. And I'll let you read the rest of it. The Big Five acquisitions, everybody talks about the Big Five. I can never remember what they are. I have to look in my own book to figure it out. But the M1 tank was one of them. Uh, MLRS, uh, the multiple launch rocket system, was another. The Bradley was the third. Uh, Apache and Blackhawk. There you go. I thought, boy, with, with a little help, I got through that. So those five things, you know, everybody thinks the airland battle somehow drove those things. The fact is, those were acquisitions that occurred prior to the airland battle. The airland battle that everybody talks about, the thing that mattered was the reorganization of the structures and formations so that the airland battle concept had nothing to do with the doctrine and the, and the weapons so much, had to do with how we were going to fight the units. And that meant things like Starry wanted to reduce the burden of administration so that companies and battalions were fighting formations and not administrative formations. So when, uh, when, when I was a company commander, I had my own central issue facility. I had to issue everything from sleeping bags to boots. By the time this came around, you didn't have that. I gave up the mess hall. I didn't have to deal with the administration of the mess hall. I didn't have a maintenance platoon. I didn't have to deal with that. A company commander in 1990's job was fight 14 tanks with about 65 people assigned. Uh, I think uh, anything else needs to be said there. And the other thing I would argue is because of the general defense position or general defense plan focus, we were talking about that before uh, we started here, if you were in Europe or you were a unit in the States bound for Europe in the event of war, you focused on something called the general defense plan. It is, you, it is known by the euphemism as the fold a gap fight. Well, there was a lot more to the general defense plan than fold a gap, but that was part of it. That gave us a sense of focus. First Infantry Division, the unit we're going to talk about today, was a reforger unit. Reforger means return of forces to Germany. So that was the consequence of Germany and the NATO allies agreed to the United States withdrawing a division from Europe, 
the second of the divisions that it withdrew from Europe in the 60s. We, dropped, we withdrew the 11th Airborne uh, in early, early 1960 or late 1959, I forget which. And then in 68, we withdrew the 24th Infantry Division. The Germans agreed to that, as did NATO, as long as we would return forces to Germany annually to uh, pre-positioned equipment, take the equipment into the field, do an exercise, and come home so that you would have dual base divisions. The 1st Infantry Division was one of those. We had two brigades in the States and one forward, 1st Infantry Division forward. Reforger gave us an opportunity when there was no money. Reforger gave us an opportunity to go do some training. And people don't realize how little money there was in the Army in 1971, 72, 73. Um, I have stories in there about guy didn't have, the company didn't have any water cans, so but Captain Bob Kelbrew went out and bought them. When I got to Germany, we didn't, couldn't get spark plugs for those miserable M114s, so you went and bought them on the economy. You know? Everybody I know that served them bought stuff for the United States Army's equipment uh, to make it run. But that did give us a culture of readiness, I would argue. Now, I'm going to go through the rest of these charts pretty quick uh, because I, I want you to see some of what we did, and I think you can best illustrate it by looking at a couple things here, if I can remember again how to do this. Some myths. The Iraqi army, fourth largest army on the planet, battle-hardened, eight years of fighting against the Iranians, and they were assessed as first rate, point blank told they were better than the U.S. Army. Some of the guys that said that were Bill Lynn and Ed Lutwak. To my immense amazement, doesn't matter how often those two guys are wrong, people still read what they write. So, you know, you, you hear this nasty stuff about the history of now, those guys take advantage of it. If I could make, figure out a way to make a living by being wrong all the time, I would damn sure jump on it because they're doing very well. Soviet equipment was also allegedly superior to our own. Now, when I got out of the Army, I went into threat emulation for the Army because one of the things I wanted to get away from was the notion that you know, the T-72 was going to superior to everything we had that you, know, you couldn't possibly beat it. I wanted to emulate the threat as it really existed, not as the MI guys wanted us to believe. And the T-72 was a dog. If you just looked at a T-72, and this is before any of us got to see them, if you just understood what its capabilities were, you knew it was going to be inferior to the M1 tank. Couldn't tell Bill Lynn that, or Ed Lutvok, or, or Von Krefeld, or any number of other, uh, quote, pundits, but it was an inferior tank to us. Now, what the M1 was, was a gas guzzler, still is. It can guzzle gas pretty much better than anything else. But you gotta remember, if you're gonna put a jet engine in a tank, and you're gonna get a tank that's fully combat loaded, it can go 60 miles an hour, you're probably gonna use some fuel. And, you know, that's okay with me, because when I'm in a tank in a fight, I don't care how much fuel we're using. And I don't think anybody else did. The Bradley fighting vehicle was, was said to be a death trap. There's a famous movie starring the guy that played Frazier, and it's called Pentagon Wars, written uh, through the good efforts of a, lieutenant, a colonel in the Air Force named Burton. Couldn't be more wrong, because what did the Bradley replace? Anybody here serve in Vietnam? Yeah. So the 113 was what it replaced, an aluminum box. You can't really drive a screwdriver through the side of it, but everything else that's fired will go through it. Uh, 7.62 will go through it, then bounce around inside. Caliber 50 will go through it, through the troops inside, and out the other side, no sweat. And oh, by the way, it had a rubber bladder for a fuel cell filled with MOGAS. And its main gun was a 50 caliber machine gun with a scared soldier on it. The Bradley fighting vehicle could launch tows and kill stuff at unbelievable ranges. First tank kill my unit had was a tow from a Bradley and a scout at 3,200 meters. And it was one hell of a piece of kit. Now, it is true, if you set the propellant on fire in the tow, a lot of soldiers could get hurt. But even those that that happened to, we only lost a couple people killed when that happened. And that sounds pretty rough if you're one of those two, but there were nine people in those things. So if you have one burned to the ground, and I'm going to show you a picture of one that burned to the ground, and two guys get killed, everybody else gets out, that's, that's pretty good compared to what, the, what happened in a 113. And the Army was not very good. Um, you'd get to go back and read the newspapers. The National Training Center was designed to train units to muscle failure. So blue units would go, and they would lose most battles. And then the pundits in the Congress would say, well, what good is this? 
You guys are losing. What nobody told, what nobody would understand or believe is if you did pretty well on day two, they ramped up day three. If you did pretty well on day four, they ramped up day five. By day nine or ten, if you're doing well, there'd be an asteroid strike because they would always raise the bar as you were going through. I remember having a session with my, uh, my OC as a battalion commander. I said, what are you guys doing? It seems like this is getting harder. He said, yeah, you guys are doing well. That's what we do here. <laughs> well, why tell me that at day 12? Why not give us a break? But every day got harder than the day before. So we were training the muscle failure. We didn't realize, frankly, we didn't realize how good we really were. We were much better uh, than people thought. I would also admit to you, though, the National Training Center was, to paraphrase, uh, the Corps Commander III Corps, General Crosby Saint, was individual training done collectively because the, tur the turbulence in units was such that the units didn't retain what they learned as well as they might have otherwise. All right, let's race through some of this. We're going to use 234 Armor as a context. That's the unit I happen to command that Captain Rick Orth uh, commanded A Company in. That's what we did in 89-90. Summer of 90, uh, you know we're getting Bradleys. We were very low on the Department of Army manpower and priority list. So we got it last. You know, I think we gave up the Brown Bess in about June, and then we got the Bradleys later in the summer. The timeline for Desert Storm for us is as you see there. We were alerted on the 8th of November. And by the 5th of December, the tanks were on railhead, gone. And that's a unit that was so low on the manpower list, and I'll show you this in a minute, I was manning nine of my 12 tank platoons. So the U.S. Army, if it has a, if you have a culture of I'm going to go with what I have, my A bag and B bag, the two duffel bags are packed and ready to go, then you can do what you have to do. And uh, uh, General Rain pointed out to me in an interview I did with him that he was surprised at how fast the U.S. Army could modernize. Well, let me tell you, if the money's there, stuff just fell out of the sky on us that we picked up at the last minute. Uh, though, I hasten to add, we also took deuce and a half trucks that were 30 some odd years old. And so we had to rebuild them in the motor pools so that we could get it. But once money was there and you could get parts, that could be done. Planes, trains, and the Jolly Rubino. We did everything, every way you could get to somewhere we used. Uh, if you see this, this guy here, that is part of an AVLB because we had a World War II rail infrastructure. We had a train derail going in to get us. 101st Airborne had trains derailing coming back because the last time anybody done any maintenance on those railheads had been World War II. So we didn't have railheads to load tanks, especially not the M1 tank, which were quite a special car. So you had to build, you know, Ma and Pa Kettle kind of, you know, uh, Appalachian sort of things. I hope nobody here is from West Virginia. <laughs> and then 18,000 troops from Fort Riley, Garlstadt, Germany, provided our third brigade. They came, they were second AD Ford. First ID Ford didn't go because they were too far down. They, they were, we were downsizing the army. And so... Out of the four divisions in Europe, only two could go, which is why the lowly, low on the priority list, first empty division got to go. And we went in everything. The Jolly Rubino was a rusty Italian row-row ship, which with perfect uh, poetry ran aground and sank off the South African coast a few years ago. She was uh, a tired old ship then. Operational phases, you see there. When we, when we say modernize, for example, our helicopters all went through uh, aviation survivability equipment upgrades. You got everything that, could, that you could get on to protect helicopters, flare, chaff, all kinds of gizmos uh, to help them operate. We got uh, the, uh, the aviation brigade had really old equipment, had older equipment than the armor battalions even uh, because it hadn't existed until that, that summer. So it turned in all of its old tactical uh, vehicles and got brand new Humvees and uh, modern five-ton trucks. I mean, this stuff just came pouring out of the depots uh, once the money was made available. Um, you see the rest of it. We moved to the port. And then from the port, and I want to tell you, uh, it is my opinion that any soldier that made the trip from the port to the desert earned their combat patch. Because if you were on that road you were in far more danger than you were going to be in a tank fight. The, the entire cultural assumption that if God wills it, I'll get home today, 
was at work. And so Saudis would drive into the back of a bus with a truck, or they'd drive into a Humvee with a truck, or a Humvee would drive into one of them, or they'd come over on our side of the road. You'd go down that road, and I swear to God, it was littered with wrecks, some of which were still smoking, because the, uh, the, the Trans-Arabian Pipeline Road was not designed for 140,000 troops in the 7th Corps to go across and also have the Saudis on the road as well. And uh, you kind of see the rest of it. So talk a little bit about gunfighting. When you plan an operation, in this case, it was a deliberate operation. And when the US Army uses the term deliberate attack, it means one of two conditions, or, or both of these conditions exist. You have time for planning, or you have accurate intelligence. Because we started planning for the breach, because the division commander volunteered to do it, and by the way, I told him years later, if I'd known that, I'd been up to complain. Uh, here we were, last on everybody's list to get anything new, and he volunteers us for what everybody says is going to be the most dangerous operation. There. What the hell was he thinking? But it turned out okay, so it all's forgiven. We, uh, we, we had the ability to begin planning the operation as far back as November when we were alerted. We didn't know where we were going to attack. We didn't know who we were going to attack. But we knew the basics, that we were going to do a breach, and then we were going to go into the Corps Reserve, and then we were going to have missions to support the Corps uh, in contingency. So we could start doing that, and that's what you see. The, the operation is planned in parallel. That's the only way you can do it while also developing intelligence. Intelligence was problematic, not because there wasn't information, but because the Army had no way to get it to anybody. 207th MI Brigade uh, supported 7th Corps. When they finally got imagery, it was delivered. Imagery was printed on paper because nobody had computers. I mean, I had one computer in my battalion, and it died of fright about the third or fourth day in the desert. It said, oh, my God, it's cold, and it's sandy, I'm done. And so we did everything with pen and ink after that. So they print all these images for us, and then they came, and they were issued in pallets. So there would be a pallet load for the 1st Infantry Division, and that would be dropped off by, you know, along with 10 other pallets by a C-130 and King Khalid Military City. And then the Corps would say, here's the pallet for 1st Infantry Division. So may have to go down here with a truck, MHE, get it on the back of the truck, drive it two and a half hours from King Khalid Military City to where we were, and then they'd have to break it out and say, okay, 14 to this unit, 12 to this other unit. By the time it got to us, it was a day late and a dollar short. The best stuff we had actually came from the Brits uh, because they had remotely piloted, come on in, sir, if you'd like, uh, remotely piloted vehicles, and they took uh, cool pictures, and they shared them with us so we could do the final planning with overhead imagery. So that is the overlay for the 1st Brigade, 1st Infantry Division of the enemy positions based on a combination of imagery, patrols, captured people. Hey, uh, dude, who's up there? And, you know, you could figure out, you could fill in the blanks. We knew who the commanders were of some of the battalions, not all of them, and we knew pretty much where they were. In this case, each of these um, little crinkly places is a platoon position. So the way you do this is you kind of look at what they, how they built their formations. From the Persian Gulf going west, the, Kuwait, the uh, Iraqis extended their line to the west as time went on. And there was a pattern to this. They would start by moving a couple of brigades out to the west, and then they would refuse the flank of a brigade. This is what's called a refused flank. He's facing west so that nobody can just go around into the back. So we knew that's how they did business. This was the position of the last time they'd refused the flank. So you start figuring, okay, if the flank is refused here, that's probably where the brigade boundary is. Then you count three platoons to a company, three companies to a battalion, and you could pretty much draw boundaries, which is what we did. And then we developed uh, eight, uh, ten digit grid coordinates for them and advised our artillery friends where they were so they could shoot them. And by the way, they shared it with uh, Rick Lacamont's unit, and, and therefore, we had uh, accurate uh, artillery grid coordinates. That's the actual graphics of the 110th Brigade commander. And if you overlay what he had with what we had, his comment was, ours was more accurate than his. <laughs> and it was true, because we actually went out on the ground, and I don't think he did much. That's the other thing. When you think about the opposition, you have to look at how they do, how they do business. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So the penetration attack. Uh, General Rain decided he was going to do a form of maneuver called penetration, which is you narrow everything down 
to a reasonable width, about eight kilometers in our case, and you stack the deck. We had 14 battalions of artillery, six or seven batteries, multiple launch rockets, and they were all itching to shoot at these guys. That's how it looked going through. The units that you see there that say UI are uh, tank companies, in one case a tank platoon. That's a tank platoon, tank company, tank company. These were their immediate reserves, and then you see how we went in. And we did what the Germans called Alf roll, and once you get in, you roll out to the flanks uh, to take them in the flank. Um, I want to stop for just a second and say one of the things I was able to do with this book was I was able to read what the Iraqis thought. So if you buy the book, one of the things you're going to find is every section, once the fighting starts, starts with the Iraqis' perception of what was going on in ours. One of the things I want to tell you is we totally misread them, and they misread us even worse than we did them. And one of the reasons that happened is, if you don't have empathy for the other side, it's really hard for you to get a, a view of how they're thinking about the problem. And empathy is even more difficult if the cultures are drastically and dramatically different. And if you think, if you believe Friedman, the world is flat, then you're mistaken, because it isn't flat. People are not the same everywhere. Culture matters. And in this case, it mattered in, a, in a many dramatic ways. And I'll leave it to you to find out what those ways were. Uh, we also didn't want anybody to get lost on the way to the trenches. We found by practice that you could plow all the way to the Black Sea as long as you were in sandy desert. So that's what we did. These are guys in on one of the lanes, and if you look up here, that's where the shooting is. So once you get in that lane, that is a lane that's going to go through the minefields, through the prepared positions, and oh, by the way, you aren't going to get lost as long as you stay in there. Then, just in case our British friends were too stupid to see the lane, we put big signs up because they're the guys going to pass through us. That happens to be Lane Charlie, one of mine. I had A, B, C, and D, and they were, we had 16 lanes. These were my, the first four were in my task force because mine was on the left flank. That started at 3,000 meters out, down to 2,000, 1,000, and then as it got closer, they had different kinds of uh, lane markers. And that's the expansion, and you see the Cavalry came out on our left flank. Um, these are just pictures of what the battle looked like. I want to talk to you a little bit about the next thing. So after, at the end of the day on the 25th, towards sunset, we got an order to pack our stuff up and move to an assembly area further north to get out of the way so the British could make the turn to the east. The British were going to go roll up the flank of the Iraqi 7th Corps, who happened to be the guys that we were fighting. So our whole purpose of our penetration was to position the Brits to roll the flank up of the Iraqi army. The two other uh, major formations of the 7th Corps, uh, the 1st Armored Division and 3rd Armored Division, would go around to the flank so that they didn't have to encounter any Iraqis as they went north. But as, um, as many of you may know, they in fact had the 1st Armored Division had a fight at a place called al Busia uh, against one of the flank uh, brigades of the Iraqi army. So as we're going north, that's kind of what it looked like on the other side. That picture on the right is from a painting I had a Marine Corps friend of mine do for me. Sat with him for two weeks to get the light right of what it looked that night. That kind of blue, uh, weird, uh, strange color. I mean, I, and what went through my mind that whole night, and when, you're in, when you're in that kind of a fight, it was long night, shooting from 10.30 till 6 in the morning. Uh, I kept having this image of Salvador Dali's watches, you know, where they're, they're melting down the wall. And, it, and, my, and there was this little voice in my head going, you can't make this shit up. You can't make this shit up. This is so surreal, it can't be made up. Yet, at the same time, they had another little voice saying, man, let's get out of here. Nobody will notice if you leave for a few minutes. But, in fact, they couldn't because I was afraid somebody would notice I was leaving. So when we, end, uh, we do find ourselves attacking the Republican Guard Forces Command, as the Corps wheeled to the east, 1st Infantry Division is on the inside of the curve. 1st Armored Division, UK Army, has already gone along the lines of the uh, frontline troops. The 3rd Armored Division, 1st Armored Division, they're on the outside of the line, and so there's a little bit of a staggered effect. The idea was to have all three divisions hit them at the same time, but it, it really did not happen that way. And so what I've done here is I tried to show you where the uh, where their boundaries were, and these that are going east-west are ours. They had position in the right place. We kind of knew 
where they would be because we had some imagery that said they were going to they were going to be generally in this area, but the imagery was delivered after the attack started. So I got two guys in a Humvee driving through a fight, you know, tracers going in both directions, trying to get to the talk with this image. But when they got it to us, they could call us and say, hey, in the next few minutes, you're going to hit this or that or the other. So we knew something about where they were, but it wasn't perfect. Um, I'll say no more about that. Phase line smash is a line right about here. And if you've ever heard of H.R. Uh, McMaster and the Battle of 72 Easting, that happened just there. So what we did that night is a forward passage of lines through the 2nd Cavalry Regiment in contact. Now, one of the other interesting things to me about that time was night attack, night alive fire attacks were too dangerous to, to train. So we never did a, a live fire night attack. But Pat Ritter and the 134 Armor didn't know that, so I heard him on his net saying, this is going to be okay because Fontenot's done this at the NTC. I didn't have the heart to tell him, no, I'd never done it, nor did I tell him that other guys were shooting at him because I was afraid he'd shoot at us uh, to return fire. Fratricide, I'll say no more about it, just let you see the pictures. That, my friends, is a Bradley shot by an Apache. Uh, we also had Bradley shot by other things, but they, when you get a tank gun round or Hellfire in it, it's going to burn. And it's mostly magnesium aluminum alloy, so it's going to burn down to kind of a puddle. Uh, uh, we're going to talk more about this later. Some immediate post-war myths. This was not the first information war. It was probably the last grease-pencil acetate war. There were, there were more things about that war like World War I than there are about multi-domain battle, for those of you that keep up with Army concepts. Here's some other myths. Low casualties, 152, or 142 in four days. No, we didn't, we didn't lose that many in four days ever in Iraq. And then when you add the Allied casualties, it's around 2,000. Then you throw in the Iraqi casualties, low casualties to whom? It would be the question I would ask you. Future wars are going to be short and decisive. Nah, I don't think so. Uh, how's it turning out for us in Iraq and Afghanistan? Neither short nor decisive. And the U.S. is the unchallenged hegemon, not so much. Why does Desert Storm matter? These are assertions. I can't prove these to you. These are things I believe. Um, technology is an enabler. It's not the answer. By the way, Bill, I read Biddle's paper. Uh, Steve Biddle uh, was a professor here, did a paper in 1995 analyzing the effect of technology in Desert Storm, and he concluded that, as we said, if we'd been equipped with the T-72s and the Iraqis had had the M-1s, we still would have beat them because we were much better trained. Revolution and military affairs are not driven by doctrine. And will unmanned systems replace people? I don't know. But I, I'm looking forward to the day we have unmanned infantry so we don't lose any infantrymen. But I suspect you're going to have to have one or two unmanned infantrymen to receive the surrender of the other side. And I'm not convinced that AI is going to solve all of our problems. But it may solve many of them. People matter more than things is my bottom line. And that's a picture of Robert L. Dougherty. The last time I saw him alive was on the 24th of February, 1991. I've been to visit him since. Got to see him for the first time in 25 years, uh, two years ago. I thought it was going to be okay. wasn't okay. I was very fortunate. I only had two killed and four wounded. Four officially wounded. I had four or five others refused evacuation. So I refused them their Purple Hearts. I fear, you know, what's fair is fair. Uh, but, you know, two killed and eight or nine wounded is bad enough. Uh, I was very fortunate compared to Henry Gold, to Hal, to uh, General Rame, you know, guys that served Vietnam where they were fighting against a class act. We were not, and I'm glad we weren't. Uh, the last thing I'd like to tell you is the existence of a soldier, even in an easy fight, sucks. We're driving through the rear of the 26th Iraqi Infantry Division on the 25th, and there's you know puddles of this, that, and the other, and a few dead guys and smoke coming up, and I'm thinking, we're beating these guys 99 to nothing, and my life stinks. What must their life be like? The dystopian existence of a soldier in combat has not changed uh, particularly. What has changed is we don't kill as many of our own people by having them bleed to death on the battlefield. You know, World War I, exsanguination, that wonderful word, you know, you get wounded and you're probably gonna bleed to death because they couldn't get you out. They had no plasma, they had no uh, whole blood. Now we have all kinds of means. Like, these kids are coming back maimed, but they're coming back and that's
that's, a, that's one of the great advantages of our technology. That, ladies and gentlemen, is my story. I went a little longer than I'd hoped to. I went about 35 minutes, but I'm done. So we're going to leap right off into me. Uh, so I wanted to start out by saying how honor, honored and humble I am just to be here among heroes. I mean, I think there's a lot of them sitting in the room up at the desk with me in the panel a lot. You probably, with the introduction ascertained, I'm probably the least scholarly or academic guy at the table, though I am the director of theater strategy. Um, <laughs> And that's uh, not lost on me. Uh, I want to leave as much room as I can for, for Bill and Richard and probably some more questions from you for Greg. But I bring, I think, a unique perspective here um, that I've developed over the couple of years that I've been in, in, in the Army. Uh, primarily, I was at the tactical level. Um, I'll tell you the timeline here in a little bit. Uh, but I was focused on gaining and maintaining success at the platoon level, the company level. I knew a little bit about what the great Colonel Marlin was trying to do in 437 Armour. Um, and quite frankly, I knew I was lucky. So I had trained for four years at West Point, graduated on 31st of May 1990. And the, the word at West Point was our Army was becoming this incredible machine. And, and then I decided to go Armour. Something was pretty crazy back then. No, a wall had fallen. No one's going to go armor. The, we're going to light. The mutua word was coming about. And I got to be a tank platoon leader in an M1A1 tank platoon. Well, actually, for the war, it was M1s. But that was the best tank in the world, bar none. Matter of fact, it still is. We have that argument later. But I knew I was lucky to be in that army. I was lucky to be in that tank platoon and lucky enough to lead those guys. And uh, I just, I didn't want to squander the fruits of the transformation that I'd heard about. It was, it was really a humble place to be. Um, so to start off, can I get a show of hands of those who've already read the book or pieces or parts of it? I know it's quite new. Right, so um, that's good and bad, but by the book. That's that, that's an easy solve of that one. Yeah, by the book, right. by nine or ten. So, uh, <laughs> Greg mentions me in a couple of times in the book, and there's some timeline in there. I'm going to expound on it. I already told you I graduated right before um, we started to throw troops at the war at, uh, on 31 May 1990. I went to Armor Officer Base course in August of 1990, and they accelerated the course. They said the only day you'll have off is maybe a little, a little bit of time on Sundays. Matter of fact, for a couple of times, we went as a class to church. Um, December 14th, 1990, I graduated from that class. And, uh, and I knew somewhere um, they announced the division was the last division chosen to go into the war. And I knew I was going with Big Red One. I was told to get to Riley quickly, um, to go see my family, and then get there. So, uh, and this is a bit detailed in the book, but I, ran, I flew out um, to California to see my family one last time. Three days, came back, met my um, classmate Mark Camarina at the airport, and uh, we were supposed to drive kind of in parallel yeah. to Riley. He decided to go see what would become his wife, his fiance at the time, um, before going to, to Riley. And I drove straight to Riley. As a matter of fact, I had lunch at a drive through because I didn't want to waste any time. Um, luck, luck happens to those who do it quickly. Signed into the division, and I got the last tank platoon. Mark will tell you, he's still mad at me about it. <laughs> he, got, he got to be an assistant support platoon leader and rode around in a fuel truck in Desert Storm. Scared every moment. Not that I wasn't, but I had a better chariot than he did, I think. So, uh, so I signed into the division 17 December 1990. I met my company commander same day, drove up to the headquarters of Delta Company 437 Armor. Tom Wolk, uh, welcomed me to the company. He said, um, tomorrow we're taking a day off. Come on in on, on the 19th. In the morning of 19 December 1990, he introduced me in front of the company and to my platoon. 
and then I spent the rest of the day with my platoon and tried to figure out, oh my gosh, I'm really going to do this. So it's incredible. So, but what I want to tell you is, some 65 days later, I LD'd with this great machine that would be the U.S. Army in Desert Storm. 65 days later, I, so I qualified my 9 millimeter, and I shot some UCOP from my tank platoon. Literally, I shot with several crews because I wanted to know how good they were. But we never did tank. They did tank armory before I got there. But I never did table 12 in my tank platoon. I never shot my M16 next to any of my soldiers. But I showed up, and we, and arguably, I had kind of a good situation unfold in front of me. The reason I point this out is to highlight <coughs> and show that that great machine that guys like Dupuy and Abrams and Starry efforted at, and General Ray, you're in this group too. Well, I mean, what foresight that you would create platoons, companies, battalions, brigades, that you knew if a guy could show up and have 60 days under his belt, that he could be successful, wildly successful at ground combat, because you trained the rest of everybody else to be a team. And quite frankly, my platoon didn't need me. To the point where when I first showed up in the desert, my platoon sergeant said, lean back, LT. I'll get them to the Alpha Alpha. Then you get the right op orders. And God bless Brother Avicola. He was one of my greatest blessings in the world. So, so I, the Army as an institution set me up for success. The great leaders envisioned that type of units. Um, one more adequately trained platoon leader could show up 65 days prior to battle and, dare I say, reach impressive success. One thing that doesn't make the book was that uh, my tank platoon, because we kept four tanks running the whole entire time, was selected to be the coordination platoon in my tank, the coordination point for the Iraqi generals to come, come meet Schwarzkopf at the airfield. General Schwarzkopf drove up right behind my tank with the six foot two guys that the brigade had selected to be his drivers and his escorts to make us look 10 feet tall instead of the Iraqis that day. And I was just lucky to be there. How does that happen? I mean, how? I, and so, while I, I love how Greg eloquently weaves the division into the transformation story that is the book, the story is the transformation. That, and, and I don't think any nation in the world can do this, bar not. I, I, don't, I don't think anybody, I mean, you might have some Germans that want to argue about it. I'm sure they would. So the next question is, who are the Dupuis, the Abrams, the Starries of today? Who gets to take the challenges of the failures of OIF and OEF? And instead of going, oh, woe is us, you know, it, it, Iraq and Afghanistan are at least as bad as what we were going through in Vietnam. We just, we can't do any better than this. To leverage that into a transformation for our Army so that the Lieutenant Cook that's in diapers today that is going to take a platoon into combat in 15 years can show up 60 days before the battle, <laughs> shake his platoon sergeant's hand, and get on with it? That's the big question, I think. And I, it's just amazing as you read the book. I hope you pull that out of it. Um, just amazing to be part of all that. Um, the other part that I think is really important here that uh, I can't squander either is this is my first glimpse at how wars ended. You know, you get to do a whole lot of reading when you're growing up at West Point and stuff, but you don't pay attention much until you get shot at, and that becomes your profession. And now your profession is to understand why things happen. And I, I walked away from Desert Storm with an uneasy sense of what the future would be, that we let Saddam Hussein stay. I mean, I thought this was a, a battle of wills, and we won. So I didn't, 
I mean, my young second lieutenant mind couldn't grasp the fact that that guy get to stay in What? And we crushed him. And we, so I remember on the backside of getting home off the airplane and eating way too much food and all that piece, I had a discussion with my family. I said, I'm going to be back there, and I'm calling it, I'm calling it by the time I'm a major. And as a major in the great 11th Armored Cavalry Regiment, I would take the regiment as their RS3 and try to craft a way to get back into Iraq and fight again. And it, we were late to the flight fight, as most of you guys know, we, we don't traditionally take the opposition forces of our National Training Center and put them into battle on the first day of a battle. So that was one of the other pieces. Um, I think there's a really bad lesson, um, and sometimes you, re you learn really bad lessons when you win big. America learned a really bad lesson here, and they criticized the Powell Doctrine because we had way too many forces than we needed, right? I mean, we did in four days. I mean, you could argue the cost-benefit analysis here that um, if we wouldn't have had that many, we couldn't have gone so fast and done so much. Okay. And I, I would echo that. But in the years to follow, in OIF and OEF and, dare I say, today, <clears throat> when we get asked, let's craft some military options for X country, our politicians believe that the Department of Defense always b brings the used car salesman argument that we need much more than we actually need to, to create success. And so they're always brokering us away from that large number, something that General Shinseki argued a couple of times in Congress. And I think that's, well, I, I don't know how to get in and around that. Um, but it's something as a as a as we turn this one more dial and we leverage what we're doing currently to some successful version of our Department of Defense that we can really save ourselves if we could have that honest uh, discussion with our political leaders. So again, so I, I'll, I'll end kind of where we started. Uh, I was lucky, lucky enough to to be on a great team uh, like the Big Red One. And uh, lucky enough to be here today, and I'll, I'll turn the floor over to Bill Johnson so he can start his comments. Duty first. Uh, like Brian, I'd like to start by thanking the AHEC personnel for, one, holding this roundtable discussion. Thank all of you for coming, and particularly I would like to thank our distinguished author for inviting me to be part of the panel. Uh, audiences deserve to understand the bias that panelists bring. So I'll be up front with mine. Uh, Colonel Fontenot and I are near contemporaries, though he is much older than I am. Um, <laughs> we first met at graduate school in 1979. Uh, he attended a seminar in military history at Duke University while he was attending that other lesser known school down a little further down Tobacco oh, Road. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll, I think we'll find that out shortly. <laughs> um, after departing graduate school, we both served in the Department of History together, and we have been friends, colleagues ever since. Uh, now, having said all that, I have to emphasize that that friendship does not stop us from brutal and candid argument and critique. As late as last night. As our fellow diners at Piatto's last night will no doubt attest. Uh, that, that tends to be our primary <laughs> debating point, uh, which I might add, uh, Kathy gets to join in on occasionally wondering what we're doing. I think it's also important to point out, in terms of a bias, I'm the odd man out on this panel. I am not a Desert Shield, Desert Storm veteran. Uh, I was at SHAPE headquarters at the time, working on the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe Treaty, so while I was a highly interested observer, I don't have much to offer. I have nothing to offer in terms of the combat portions of this book. However, I think as Greg's near contemporary, uh, I have some valid perspectives to offer on the first element of the book. And so if, if you haven't bought it, and I do encourage you to, it's a great book, this title and this cover immediately draws you to the combat elements of Desert Storm and the feats of the Big Red One, and, I'm, and rightly so. But what I would really hope is that you do not skip over or skim over the first 65 pages 
that talks about the transformation of the army that occurred. Greg intentionally begins the book with that story because I agree with him. I don't think you can understand the success of Desert Shield, Desert Storm if you don't understand how the army changed in that 20 year time period. Um, in fact, without those transformations, I think there could have been a remarkably different set of outcomes from what happened in the first Gulf War. Uh, it's going to be hard to tell, but Greg and I did not coordinate our remarks beforehand, but he rightfully, as the author, stole much of my thunder what I was going to talk about. Uh, but one of the things I would argue, and, and many people in this room lived through this period. For those of you that did not live through the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, I think Greg gets it almost exactly right. Uh, it was a tremendous transformation. Now, many people in this room who've lived through the transformation of the drawdown of the Army after Desert Shield, Desert Storm, the Balkans, more importantly, the transformations of the Army that have taken place during the long wars of the last 15 years, uh, you understand what transformation is. Part of the argument I will make, which I don't think comes out in the book as much, was that the recent transformations began with a highly trained, very skilled, tremendously professional and well-led force. I uh, can't always say that that was the case in the 1970s and 1980s. The army that many of us faced at that time, uh, drugs, race relations, endless turnover. I'm sure that many in this room carried armed. We were armed when we were staff duty officers. Uh, there was a reason why we were armed. Uh, a lieutenant in my battalion and my brigade was almost choked to death uh, one night on duty. Uh, these were not particularly good times. And uh, interestingly enough, there were, it wasn't all gloom and doom. My first company commander was on his fourth company command. Two of those had been in combat. He knew how to be a company commander. He knew how to lead troops in Vietnam. I had just come out of the basic course where we had been beaten to death with the lessons of the Arab-Israeli 1973 war. And it was an entirely different army that we were going to try and produce. I think that the lessons that Greg draws out from that period may have some benefit for those who are going to look at what sort of transition is going to occur in the next 15 years. How do we take the lessons that we've learned from the last 15 years of the long wars and do we get to apply them or do we have to learn new lessons, which I think this book does a tremendous job of describing. I'm not going to wander over all of the things Greg talked about on his first chart in, in terms of the things that were done well, that many people in this room lived and led, um, and for which we should be grateful. Um, top of that, I think I'll just quickly wrap up. Uh, first of all, in reading the first two chapters, um, I thoroughly enjoyed reliving my childhood. Uh, thank you. Um, it's long been said that success has many fathers, failure has is an orphan. Um, I would second Greg's point about William Westmoreland. Uh, I have not always been a historical fan of General Westmoreland, uh, but I do think Greg's right in this question. Um, and he's provided a necessary corrective to a rather uh, one-dimensional, unflattering portrait. I think he gives credit where it's due for Army senior leaders. Uh, I do have to admit I was a little surprised that Max Thurman did not make it into the book as part of the transformation. But these are all minor, minor, minor issues. Um, so if I were to offer a critique, and it's a very mild one, uh, I don't think Greg went into as much detail on the transformation, or some elements of that transformation, at least as I would have liked. However, he does cover them, cover them quickly, briskly, and if you have a desire to learn more about the events that he describes very quickly, uh, I would offer Beth Bailey's American Army, James Kitfield's Prodigal Soldiers, and Dan, then Major Dan, Dan Bolger's Dragons at War. They will give you three very different perspectives of how those transformations took place. Um, I think Dean Lackamont's going to cover some of this uh, a little bit later, but uh, just given my bent, uh, I would have liked to have seen a little more formal insights, lessons learned. While history does not provide lessons learned, I do think history can give us insights to guide the present and the future. And so again, 
In no way should this detract from the overall quality of the book. I second it. Uh, even if you don't buy nine, two or three would be worthwhile. Um, at the same time, I have to be careful that I'm not criticizing Greg for writing the book I wanted, as opposed to the book he needed to write. And in order to keep the book within a reasonable scope, I think he balances that, uh, the transformation aspect very carefully with the combat narrative. And like everyone else, I think, who has or will read the book, that combat narrative pulls you along. It's fast-paced, it's well-written, and it is worth the read for the next generation of soldiers that are going to come and have to serve the nation. So with that, again, I'd like to thank Ehek for sponsoring this and for all of you for coming out on this brisk March day. Thank you. <laughs> Well, let me start off by uh, echoing Bill in uh, my thanks to the, organiz the organizers, uh, to, to Greg Fontenot for this wonderful book, and I do commend it. I mean, it was really, uh, and I'll talk a little bit more about my background, it was a, a fascinating to read start to finish, really, that kind of the scenes, things I've studied historically, and then having lived through Desert Storm, albeit from a, a slightly different angle, uh, but to see some of the things in there. And just to give you an idea of some of the things that I think aren't captured in typical books about wars, you know, the, the battle part is, is, the, is the fairly standard part. Uh, but the part that I found myself very impressed with is sort of the recapturing some of the elements of what it takes to get a unit prepared for battle and get it into battle to include uh, the things that went on in this particular event, getting our equipment on ships, moving them, going through the port, having to deal with the assembly, and things that I think that are kind of, you know, lost as the unsexy part of it that really are at the crux of what it takes to make an organization this size, this complexity, be prepared to get into the position where it can execute the battles. Everybody might focus on those 100 hours, but it was 15 years from Vietnam in many regards to get ready, but it was also you know, years of preparation by the individuals and then months and weeks of other events that fell into place, not because they, I mean, not easily. This is an incredibly complex event, and he lays that out very nicely. What I'd like to do is uh, go back to his part about uh, the you know, Desert Storm is kind of a forgotten war, and, and frankly, here at the War College, uh, we have made it unforgotten as much as we can. We stuck it fairly prominently into the curriculum, and I'll spend a little bit of time on that towards the end as to how we use Desert Storm. But I'll also put down sort of a marker to say, as with any particular war, there are things you learn, and you should also be mindful of what you don't learn from that one, and be mindful that there may be other things you have to pay attention to. And in that regard, uh, I'll come back to, at the end, a, a broader theme. We've, we mentioned how a lot of this was framed, uh, as Bill just said, with respect to how the Army recovered from Vietnam. You've heard about General Depew. You heard about General Westmoreland as Chief of Staff, things he did to help instigate some of the improvements that led to Desert Storm. Uh, but I have to admit that when I get to the end and I get to some of the things Brian mentioned in terms of what we saw in the last 15 years of war, Desert Shield and Desert Storm, there's kind of a missing piece to my mind of we sort of skipped over what should we have learned from Vietnam so that when we ended up in very similar circumstances, i.e. counterinsurgencies and complex stability operations. Why weren't we as familiar with what we had done in Vietnam when we got to that point? And again, that's not a, that's not a hit on Desert Storm, but I'm mindful of that it's a, we've got a big organization with a lot of pieces of our professional portfolio. We should be mindful of what we learned from Desert Storm and some of the things we didn't and things we might have to think about and we do think about now. Uh, just a, a, a brief, brief uh, on my background. I was in one of the other first divisions in the Seventh Corps, so a core of five divisions, four were firsts. Nobody wants to be anything but first. There's the first cavalry division, the first infantry division. I was in the first armored division. And of course, to compound all that, there was another first armored division from the United Kingdom in the Corps. So that we, and then we had a third armored division and a second ACR. But otherwise, you know, everybody wanted to be first. Uh, but I was in the first armored division that was on the left flank, and I was an artilleryman at the time. It mentioned in my bio that I was artillery and strategist. This is the time I was six years in as a captain in the first armored division artillery. My first tour had been in the 82nd Airborne Division, so going back to the expeditionary part, I was, it was interesting to watch the 1st Armored Division become expeditionary uh, when it had not thought that way when I first got there uh, before the wall came down. But there is that idea of the different parts of the Army that are there. The 1st Armored Division uh, was, was very active, a little more of the deliberate attack plan that we were able to execute, probably more able to follow the, the plan. I mean, we had to make modifications, but to follow what we were able to do there. And, and had a fairly significant artillery duel with the, with the Iraqis. They were very bad. Uh, we were very good. 
uh, but they had better equipment than I, we did in some regard. So partly getting at the technology overlooks, you know, that really, and artillery was one area where, aside from MLRS, our artillery wasn't as good on paper as a lot of what the Iraqis had. But our system was much, much better. We could target, they could not. When they fired at us, they usually died. If we fired at them, they couldn't get back at us very easily. So it was a, a much different experience there, but I'll leave that off to the side. I'm going to focus now kind of from my stamp uh, perspective as a strategist, because that's what happened uh, uh, after Desert Shield Storm. I did go off to graduate school, ended up at, at uh, West Point myself, but in the one of the other departments, the Department of Social Sciences there in the mid-90s. And so what I found myself doing is looking back on Desert Storm and looking at what was going on in the mid-90s as we were going through the drawdown in the wake of the Cold War, trying to determine how we should transform. And part of the analysis was, you know, the claims that we should do a revolution in military affairs. In reality, what most of the Army was doing was what we now call stability operations. Back then, we had them very awkwardly and inappropriately labeled as military operations other than war. Because uh, frankly, these were the sorts of things that actually happen when you need coercive force, violence, and you just haven't gotten to war and you're trying to prevent them in many cases. So I think how we tied that in professionally is part of the story. But if I may, it's just sort of, you know, what we saw in, in Desert Storm was really militarily, uh, tactically, operationally, and strategically, so outstanding performance by the military. But when we look uh, tactically, we should be mindful, I said, as I said, about what missions we really didn't do. But let's start by acknowledging what happened in Desert Storm is we had a defense and deterrence. And my original division, the 82nd Airborne Division, which doesn't get a lot of credit uh, in this war because they didn't have to do much fighting when they went out way to the west to screen. But they were part of that deterrence model. They got to the desert first and were how much of a speed bump they would have been to Iraqi forces they went south isn't clear, but most assumed they would be just some version of a speed bump. But that was a particularly important role to be able to play quickly to get there. We had the attack that we've talked about, movement to contact, exploitation and pursuit, be some of the titles people put on it. And when I returned back to Germany and my unit, and, and going back to the point of what happened, uh, if Saddam had waited a year, my unit wouldn't have existed to deploy. Uh, when we returned to U Germany, the 1st Armored Division deactivated. The flag went north to the old 8th Infantry Division in Bombholder. Some of us stayed. I moved to the 3rd Infantry Division. And as soon as we got back there, most of us, most of the, ours was a combat unit, but the others that had not deployed immediately declared us untrained uh, for combat because we had done a very simple exploitation in pursuit. So we were immediately shuffled off to Hohenfels and to Grafenwehr to go through <coughs> training so that we could become combat ready again uh, after having been through a war. So there were some of these tensions in terms of what had we really done there, and even at the, right afterwards we had a bit of that. And we started looking towards Bosnia. Uh, the Soviet Union did exist during Desert Storm. By December 1991, the Soviet Union did not exist, but Germany had already reunified in 1990, and in Europe, without a lot of the parades and welcome home, a lot of it just turned back to what's the business now of who, those who stay, and it was Bosnia, and looking at what does it mean to go in there. Our unit did not at that time, but the 1st Armored Division in a later manifestation was the first to go in, and I would submit that you keep peace pretty well when the thing you show up with is an armored division. Uh, it tended to have a pretty important impact on the non-combatant or the combatant or potential combatants there. But operationally, uh, there were also insights that we were very good at the service level. When it came to combined arms operation, the Army, the Marine Corps, the Navy, and the Air Force, I think, did very well in their lanes. And, and if you look at a lot of the coordination command and control for this operation, there's a lot of drawing lines to make sure we didn't have to coordinate that much. We still did you know, a fair amount, but a lot of it was fire support coordination lines or measures to separate where the Air Force was going to be from the Army. The Marines and the Army were stuck in different places. We separated them from the Arab Armed Forces. And so there was a lot of coordination measures which really weren't joint, but they were more sort of division of labor and coordination. And so there's a lot, when we say this is you know, five years after Goldwater Nichols, that we come together jointly. There's a lot of things that said we weren't quite there yet. Even the idea of General Schwarzkopf as the ground component commander, trying to be that, that senior guy who, or the, the lowest rank guy who pulls together the Marines, the, the Arab, or the, the armies, and, and so that sort of coordination wasn't particularly impressive, certainly compared to where we've gotten to now. But nonetheless, it worked. Uh, but part of it was, had to do with an enemy that didn't challenge a lot of those coordination measures that probably weren't as strong as they could have been. Uh, and lastly, sort of strategically, very impressive militarily, how we were able to deploy from strategic distances, from the United States, from Germany, places we were able to get there. For all the problems we had with logistics and some of the other things, really an incredible feat to actually get those forces to the desert and make them available for that, that, uh, that event. 
Now, in terms of the outcome, we know it was, uh, you know, we defended Saudi Arabia effectively, an important task early on, you know, where I mentioned the 82nd and others. We liberated Kuwait. But when it came to regional stability, uh, we're, it's questionable how much we'd actually accomplished. And part of the evidence was that we had to stick around and participate in kind of a containment regime, Northern Watch, Southern Watch, keeping forces in Kuwait because of the sort of the strategic ambiguity of that. Not that it was incorrect, but just, you know, in terms of where were we in accomplishing regional stability. Obviously, we still saw Iraq as a threat. And the big question of sort of where did we stand with the new world order that President Bush had talked about, and did we establish that? And that leads me to the last point I'll make just very briefly in terms of what we have done with Desert Storm. We kind of looked back as we were looking a few years ago for a way to sort of pull the main threads of the curriculum together so that we could sort of uh, sort of show what right looks like for our students in terms of thinking about war at the strategic level right at the beginning of the curriculum. We looked around at different cases and settled on the Persian Gulf War, the 1990-91 Persian Gulf War, as the best case uh, for what we were looking to do, at least for the time being. Partly because it allowed us to get the major themes of our curriculum, certainly issues about the nature and character of war, how that might be changing when you look at things like the revolution of military affairs, information war, whatever the, the characterizations you hear. Uh, looking at national security policy and strategy in terms of the instruments of national power, diplomacy, uh, information, military, economics, how that played out. A sense of wars and where the military fits in at different levels. There was a global context, the Cold War, which was coming to the end, but it was still an important calculation for our leaders into how do we deal with the Soviet Union and what, and what is happening in Europe. Well, nonetheless, now there's other issues emerging in the world in terms of where do we come down on issues in the Middle East or regionally. And that context of the Cold War sort of sets up an interesting dynamic in terms of different levels. Uh, the global war with a or context with a regional context in terms of peace in the Middle East. And rem don't forget Israel's aspect and how it affects operations, as well as dealing with the specific Iraqi threat and the Iranians next door. And then just the bilateral, or sort of the, the one-on-one, how do you deal with a particular adversary, particular uh, combatant. And then adding that into the big five you've heard mentioned, you know, the institution that we had, how did we get that institution? How did we uh, understand what that institution meant in terms of what it permitted us to do, what its deficiencies were, it wasn't perfect, GPS was relatively new, the lack of compass on tanks, a lot of things where we assumed we're fighting in Germany with a fairly clear foe on train we understood and wearing green and, you know, and yet what happens when you throw us into a desert? I was in the Seventh Corps, most of us attacked still wearing green uniforms, we repainted the vehicles, uh, but we, we did get our chocolate chip uniforms for the redeployment home. Uh, looking at all, the, I mentioned the, the sort of theater strategy and campaigning aspects, how we connected uh, theater level and uh, operational commands, jointness, combined arms operations, or combined operations with our allies and partners. And then, uh, the, and of course, strategic leadership throughout all this. How did the leaders perform? And we use Schwarzkopf and Powell in particular to take a look at how they thought through the different things going on. So the last thing I'll leave you with is just to sort of uh, to set that in that larger framework of professionalism. And I would mentioned, um, you know, the sort of going back to the Vietnam War. It just so happened that yesterday, yesterday uh, was the 50th anniversary to the day of the My Lai Massacre in Vietnam. And uh, to its credit, uh, the Army Judge Advocate General's Corps uh, held an event in the Pentagon. General Milley attended to start it off. There were several panelists. I was on one of the panels talking about sort of the evolution of the Army profession since Vietnam. And uh, what, one of the things that comes out there is really what it means to be a profession and how much effort we've put into understanding those dynamics. We talk about professional expertise. It's more than just battle. It's more than just the violence part. It's that coercive force, the sense of jurisdictions of practice that include major combat operations, but also include stability operations, as we call operations other than war now, include deterrence, include homeland security, and include how we develop our own professionals. These are areas, if we look back to Vietnam, to say we may have missed some of the pieces that we have been tested against in the last 15 years. The idea that we can't let uh, our ability to deal with adversaries who choose insurgencies. We don't typically choose counterinsurgency. Our adversaries choose other things, and how we deal with that and so making sure that we keep that uppermost as well. So the Desert Storm stands out as a very positive, very important event, very much worthy of study and analysis, and I think we, we, we certainly emphasize that here at the War College, but not complete. There's other things there to, to be mindful of. What, didn't, what don't we see there? And go even back to the Vietnam War. Have we fully captured what we should from that? And adding that into the broader suite. 
So again, my thanks to, to everyone here for uh, helping pull this together, and particularly Greg for such a, a, a great book, which I think really is an important contribution to what we, how we understand ourselves as a profession, and great, uh, a great event for, or, uh, for discussion today. So with that, uh, I'll wrap up and, and turn out to, I guess, for questions at this point. At this point, we will take questions from the room. I do ask you wait until we come over with the microphone uh, because we are recording the lecture. So uh, any questions for any of our panelists at this point? You look at the pictures there. How do the tankers know who to shoot at? I mean, it seems like uh, it's pretty hard to find the targets. Well, I, I, I'll let Brian have a shot at this too, but one of the problems with uh, the M1A1 tank, which is we, we turned in M1 IPs and, and drew hand-me-down M1A1s when we got to Saudi Arabia, the thermal imaging capability on the M1A1 tank was inferior to the integrated sight unit on the Bradley fighting vehicle and the M60A3 tank as well. The Army, to build the M1, it's the greatest combination of hang the expense and, boy, we can't afford any more dollars on this tank. So we had a completely inadequate uh, thermal system. The problem with it was you could see targets at four or five kilometers with the thermals day or night, but you couldn't identify them. And when you go, there's a, there's a taxonomy of, of identification. I, I acquire a target, then I classify it. It's a tank, it's a, it's a wheel. Then I begin to get down to identification. It's ours or theirs. So if, if you're shooting at anything beyond about 1,500 meters, you really don't know what you're shooting at. Now, in, in, in the States, we went through a thing called the TIS Festival every night. Thermal Imaging System Festival, because three corps commander, a man named Tom Graves, made us introduce friendly targets into the target array. And he also made us shoot beyond the parameters of the U.S. Army's tank gunnery manual. Tank gunnery manual says never shoot left or right of your fender, you know, which is less than 10 degrees. But in combat, you're liable to have to shoot off the side of the deck. So Graves did all that for us. In Germany, they couldn't do that because their range fans you know, imagine Graf and Veer Hohenfels, very narrow, so they always shoot, shot at stuff out right over the front of the tank. And the second thing is they always shot at only enemy tanks. No, no, no friendlies appeared in their targets. So I think there's correlation, not causation necessarily, between units in Germany shooting, you know, the, the, I can remember what it was like to be in Germany. It was shoot them all, God will sort out his own. And so there was, there was a lot of that kind of thinking. And in the 1st Infantry Division, we had several fratricides, uh, all but one, uh, no, all but two caused by uh, 266 Armor, which was a Germany unit that had no experience at the National Training Center, wasn't used to seeing uh, friendly targets. On the night of the 26th, 27th of February, they got in a 360-degree fight. Because contrary to what some people say, the Iraqis fought back. Uh, they would let you pass by, then they'd shoot RPGs at you. And, you know, we had guys repelling borders. Uh, one of my captains, a guy named Juan Toro, uh, his gunner, his loader, actually pushed a guy off the tank, and, you know, Toro's yelling at him to shoot him. They shot a guy coming over the front slope with the coax machine gun, and Toro personally emptied all 15 rounds of his 9 millimeter into another guy who came over. He shot him until he was sure that guy was going to quit twitching, okay? You know, it, you know people say, well, why'd they shoot him 17 times? Because if you're in a fight, you start shooting, you're not going to stop shooting until you're out of ammunition, frankly. Now, we've kind of segued away from identification, but 1,500 meters. So I told my guys, nobody shoots beyond ranges of 1,500. So what we would do during the night is we would advance by position improvement, which you can do in the desert because you can advance like ships at sea. So we would go forward at a, at a pretty slow pace until we could see targets. Then we would stop. We would range to the target. Oh, the target's 1,700 meters. Okay, let's go a little closer. Then we get to 1,500 say, okay, what are they? And then we decide what we could see. I would divide the target array up, and they would all shoot volley fire. So what you'd do is, I'm going to shoot, and, they, and the rule was shoot two tanks at every target, so that you, you know, and then shoot in volleys. So they go four, three, two, one, four tanks would shoot, two targets would blow up, and then we'd move on. 
134 uh, Armor on our right, uh, led by a far braver commander than me, they went 30 miles an hour and shot at, you know, they were just, they were scary as hell. And they scared the Iraqis even worse than they scared me, but they scared me too. Because it's really hard to see and identify when you're on the move and people are shooting at you. Uh, and I think anybody that's been in combat, one of the things, I, I'm one of the smartest guys I know because I only needed four days or 10 days of shooting. And the first time somebody shot at me, I learned everything I needed to know. After that, it was all postdoctoral training. So that's a long answer to a short question. What do you want to add, Brian? Um, so I'll start off with, so there's a gunnery skills test that like every soldier that ever gets in a tank does. TCGST is what it's called. Yeah. Um, and part of that is deck of card, friendly enemy. And they show you, here's what it looks like in the daylight. Here's what it looks like in the thermals. Here's what it looks like at 1,000. 2,000, and we went, same type of, how far can you push this thing? 3,000, you know? So you could see a T-72, the difference between a T-72 and an M1 at 3,000, ooh, that's ooh, tough. Not much. 2,000, you're probably getting there. You're in there at 1,500, right? But you knew the markers, right? So there's a, uh, <coughs> there's a bore evacuation device on an M1 tank. In the middle of the gun tube, there's this big bulb no other tank has that thing. So you knew you weren't shooting. But what's the problem? These, things, these guys named the Egyptians came out to play with us. And I never forget, we got up in the cabals and um, got into to our first TAAs. And uh, a guy from first platoon comes screaming over the net, there's T-72s right there. Yes, those are the Egyptians, and they're on our team. <laughs> But nicely, the division and their planners, along with, uh, you know, trying to figure this thing out best for waging combat, put those guys onto our flank and back <laughs> for the conduct of the war. But initially, that would really trip you up. The other thing is there's a ge geometry of battle that, that you very quickly figure out when you get into it. When you are heading into, into the, you're in the lanes and you're going north, the bad guys are that way. And the good guys are this way. And even though I turned left to go meet some guys from 3rd Armored Division and do some coordination, there was a truck that was shooting at me and my company. And we did shoot right off the right flank on that one. Interesting enough, here's the other part of it. You got to shoot the right munition when you shoot at a target. So that was like a, a deuce and a half truck with a guy with a 12.7 machine gun on top, a crazy Iraqi wanted to shoot at an American tank company. I'm convinced he just wanted to go see the 72 versions, but okay. So we did a contact drill on everybody battle carried a round called a Sabo. The Sabo round goes about two miles a second, it's kinetic energy round, and has no explosive t uh, tenure to it, right? What did, my, what did my Sabo round do to the side of a deuce and a half truck? Punch through it like a piece of paper. Didn't do it unless you hit the guy. Of course, we had a very slow XO who lost all his um, gyros, or all his uh, capability to uh, move it uh, by power. So he was, uh, had no power to assert. So he got over there by just cranking the gun over it. In that time, he loaded heat and launched a big heat round and blew that thing up, kind of Starsky and Hutch out, you know, tires going everywhere. So it was a good day. But I think the geometry much helps. But the problem is, when we get in the 360 fights, geometry does no favors to you. That's right. So you've got to stay inside a range, then you're back. If you're in the 360 fight, you're back into inside of 1,500 meters, period. You know, so. I think, uh, I think it's also good. fair. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. I think it's also fair to say frightened people uh, make bad decisions. And. You know, one of the things you have to, as a commander, I, I felt I could do because of the optimal condition for the American Army in 1990 was to fight Iraqis in the open desert. I mean, you just couldn't ask for anything better. Uh, because of that, I could impose uh, harsh control measures, say, hey, we're not shooting until. And, and that, in my mind, was important enough to be sure we weren't shooting other Americans uh, or people who shouldn't be shot. I mean, they're, if somebody's trying to give up, you owe them an opportunity to at least have a shot at giving up. You don't have to risk your own life by the law of land warfare. And so, you know, there was a lot of talk about mine plows being used in trenches ought to entitle us to be tried as war criminals. Sorry, that's not the case. If they, they shouldn't have joined, if they couldn't take a joke. 
It's okay to plow right through them. It's okay to shoot at them. It's okay to shoot machine guns at them a thousand meters away. But if they're trying to give up and you can see that, then you have an obligation to try to do it. So acquisition and recognition and understanding the ranges at which that's possible. It's a physics problem. Long answers. You made a comment about understanding the culture. And your story has kind of a happy ending. <laughs> the story, what, 13 years later, 14 years later, still doesn't have a happy ending. Uh, so what went wrong? What lessons weren't learned in that time you know, compare your story to the current story that's still ongoing. Uh, at, at the end of, I had the opportunity to write the Army's history of the invasion in 2003. And when the invasion occurred in 2003, we captured everybody that mattered, and we captured their documents. The Joint Advanced Warfighting Program, which was a subset of Joint Forces Command, had money for a number of years. The money ran out back in 15. So we haven't finished the job. But the Conflict Records Research Center is what this thing was called. And they translated Iraqi documents. In fact, when I ran the University of Foreign Military and Cultural Studies, we started with uh, a theory block and then we went to culture as the second thing. Because you cannot, you cannot adequately cope with an opposition that you do not understand for which you have no capability of achieving empathy. Even in World War II, uh, an anthropologist named Ruth Benedict wrote Chrysanthemum and the Sword trying to do an analysis of Japanese culture because we were puzzled by the Japanese. Um, give you an example of how, how important that is. In 2000, as a threat emulator, I wanted to do suicide attacks in an Army, in a, in an Army Joint Forces Command war game. They, they forbid it. I was going to go against Navy using boats, get a boat alongside a, a, a gray hull and blow it up. Uh, they said, no, our security is too good, and who would do that? So I gave them a briefing on Operation Iceberg, kamikazes, 130 naval vessels damaged or sunk, more Marines and, and sailors killed in Okinawa than any other battle in the history of the United States in a single battle, or in the history of the U.S. Navy and Marine Corps, not the United States. So I said, look, guys, Kamikaze attacks, suicide attacks are a fact. Well, you know, a few weeks later, the cold blew up, and all of a sudden, I was prescient. I wasn't prescient. I just read some history. What I did with this book is I read what the Iraqis were thinking and doing, and it is amazing to me how much they knew about us. They tracked the Seventh Corps, counted all the tanks as we went through King Khalid, or uh, through Hafer al Button. And we were forbidden to, you know, talk on the radio, do anything, you know. You couldn't go outside at night. I mean, all kinds of rules so they wouldn't see us. Well, they did see us because, you know, they had line crossers. Their attachés in Belgrade were getting information from the Serbs who were getting it from the Russians. I mean, they, had, they knew where we were, and they kind of sort of knew where we were going to go. They thought the left the hook, the great left hook, was going to go further out to the west than it did. And, the, and that's why they had dug all these holes. They dug revetted positions, badly dug them, because nobody checks anything in that culture. That's part of their problem. And so they had holes that they could go to if we came where they thought we would. And we did. And so they moved into those holes, and we killed them in those holes instead of a different set of holes. But what we never understood at the, at the national level, and frankly, I'm not as enthusiastic about Powell and Schwarzkopf now uh, as I was then, because when you go look at how they managed war termination, I think they hosed it up, and I think they bear the responsibility for it, not George H.W. Bush, because he would have given them the time they needed to do some of the things that people have been second-guessing ever since. So how you end the war, coming back to it, depends on how, what you understand about the enemy. We did not understand these people, and we still don't. And so what happened in 2003 you could see the handwriting on the wall. By 2001, we're going to go to war by God no matter what. And this is a personal opinion. I think it was a terrible mistake because we didn't understand them any better. Now, when, when that was driven home for me, was you know not understanding Arabs is one thing, but I, went, I led the first U.S. troops into Bosnia in 19, December 1995, you know, with the 100-year flood and the tactical bridging and all of that happy stuff. 
And, you know, you get into Bosnia, and everybody looks like Europeans, but they're not. They're not Europeans. They just look like Europeans. They don't think like Europeans. Their notions and their culture is fundamentally different than that in Western Europe. And, and that, was, that really drove it home for me, because when Bill was at that lesser school uh, down the way in Durham, and I was at the great University of Chapel Hill, I studied the coming of World War I, dipl diplomatic history from 1870 to 1914. Wanted to go to Sarajevo my whole life. Well, be careful what you wish for. <laughs> I did not understand it. So I came out of that determined that culture was an important part of what we do and that we shouldn't, we shouldn't even contemplate going to war with someone. I, you know, I don't get to make that, that decision unless we thought about how they view the world. Because the notion that uh, Saddam was irrational is, is mistaken. He was perfectly rational. If you understand, Saddam was uh, part of the Bedocracy, as they call it. He came from a, from a Bedouin culture, and, I, and that's an overstatement, but close enough. And he was from Tikrit, which is, you know, Al Tikriti is, uh, you know, that's not cosmopolitan Baghdad. If Baghdad's cosmopolitan, uh, which is to, cos you know, Baghdad is cosmopolitan as, as Junction City, Kansas is to New York City, okay? They're two different things. But Tikrit is the provincial, provincial part of, of, of Iraq. So this guy's rational behavior was based on tribal politics and Ba'ath Party politics, and we didn't understand that. And we still, and that's how we got into the mess, I think. That's part of how we got into the mess. Plus, we also had the attitude that you could spread democracy with a bayonet, and I'm not, I'm not convinced that's true. Now, that's an opinion, okay? I can't prove any of that. Who's the Sir? Shared opinion. There are some, my, my division commander shares my opinion. I'm, that, that's two of us, you know. That's two of us. I, I think the two of us have it right. <laughs> I mean, well, I'll just add, uh, I, kind of, I kind of got at it at the, um, in terms of, by the way, I went to, the next time I was in Iraq was uh, the summer of 2003 when I ended up in Mosul with the 101st Airborne Division. And this was, uh, and it's a division I'd served in for a few years during the, in the 90s, but we had deployed units to Kosovo from that division. And we went through a similar thing. We'd send off, uh, and I didn't personally go, but I was a battalion, XO of an artillery battalion there. We'd sent off one of our batteries to participate in the brigade that went to Kosovo. Came back and, of course, immediately declared them non-combat ready uh, and told them that their work on behalf of national security was not appreciated. Uh, but we were also, so we had this thing about lesser included uh, objectives and things that we kind of tended to discount. And we've done this in the 90s. And uh, 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 somebody mentioned Walt Ulmer earlier, and I think this is another one, one of these heroes to be noted from this era of the Army's transformation. Uh, Westmoreland asked the Army War College to do a study in 1970 on the professional, on, on what was going on, and Walt Ulmer, as a lieutenant colonel, was part of that study group. And that's the one where they identified a lot of the problems of deprofessionalization of the Army, that probably when you get to Mili and things like that, you realize ticket punching, body counts, things of the bureaucracy that were going on, lack of training of officers, NCOs, soldiers, draftees, of course. But it wasn't just the poor quality soldiers. The Army had helped induce a lot of this. So how do we come back to being a profession? In the late 1990s, while in retirement, he came back out to do work on another professionalism study. This time uh, it was based out of the Center for Strategic and International Studies. And it came out in 2000. But in a lot of the interviews, if you read in there, one of the things listed as a tension was these, it, they were calling it UTWA, operations other than war. This tension between what we were doing in Somalia, Haiti, Bosnia, and Kosovo in the 90s versus what we were told we were supposed to be doing. And at the time, it was seen as, are we asking our troops to do too much, be combat ready, and do these other things? And this idea that these other things weren't important, were lesser included, or whatever title was put to them. Then we end up in Iraq and Afghanistan, and it turns out, just like most wars in US history, if you actually want durable gains for your policy aims at the end of war, usually you have to sustain some control afterwards. We did it in Germany, we did it in Japan, we did it in the Philippines, we had to do it in the South after Civil War, failed, still working on it. Um, but we have been trying to do, I mean, this is a, a part of the Army's portfolio that it doesn't like, but always gets. And so at some level in Iraq and Afghanistan, we had a similar version of that. We did the battle well, and then there were strategic issues. The policy aims, I won't say, weren't suspected and shouldn't be, uh, uh, shouldn't be analyzed, but the Army didn't help. And it was, and you could watch the way some of the units behaved. And it's actually interesting. It was very, uh, there was a sense of, you know, when the chaos of all the looting after we deposed the government came up, one of our generals looked and said, I was looking around and supposed to, how is, who's responsible for order here? And then it suddenly it dawned on him, I am. We got rid of their government and their army. We're there, and if you, we wanted some durable outcome in Iraq, 
we had to take some responsibility for not necessarily turning them into a liberal democracy, yeah. but establishing some sort of order. The insurgency didn't happen right away. It came when we sort of lost control in some regards. And I would say that that's where, I, you know, it's not the army failed, but the army was complicit, I think, in some of the ways we could have probably achieved better outcomes. And so whether the policy aims themselves, and I'll, and I'll go back to the Vietnam War when uh, Louis Sorley was on the panel yesterday. He's the author of A Better War. He talks about what Abrams did after 1968 to help improve, and there's some, he makes the claim, debatable perhaps, that we actually won the counterinsurgency by 1972. The reason the North Vietnamese attack with conventional forces in 72 is that Cords and other things, and Phoenix have succeeded essentially driving the Viet Cong out. But the American people are no longer interested in the Vietnam War. Things like My Lai and the draft, they're done. And so we won the war after the American public no longer cared. And then when we pulled out, then the North Vietnamese did invade conventionally and defeat South Vietnam. There's a similar version of that with the surge, that we kind of left ourselves a negative situation that we recovered in the surge, then walked away from when we didn't stick around. I mean, so there's things about what can the military contribute that I think is worth looking at to say what's our role in doing that as well as we can. Policy aims are not our decision, but there, I think there are ways we could contribute better than we did. I, as a military historian, I can't pass up talking about Carl von Clausewitz, the, as we refer to him as old dead Carl. Uh, two critical things that he says. One is war is a continuation of policy by other means or with the addition of other means. And in war, the result is never final. And so to your question, I think, we have to examine the difference between winning and victory. They are not synonymous. You can achieve military victory, but not necessarily achieve political winning. And that, to... Greg's earlier point is this question about the empathy. You, you, need, you should have no sympathy for your opponent whatsoever. But if you don't have empathy, you are probably not going to formulate your policy in a suitable way to achieve the ultimate national objective. And I think we have a disconnect at times between this what is military victory versus political winning. I think that's a, a, a very interesting comment, and, and it brings to my mind, uh, at least, what do we, how do we look at MacArthur and his notorious success as the supreme commander in Japan after World War II? Now, this was not necessarily as institutional as it was individual with MacArthur. So is he just an outstanding example of someone who understood the concept? Or is there something else involved? Just a quick thing on that, and actually, um, I think it is a success, and it's, it's individual and institutional. Yeah. The U.S. Army built a U.S. government school in 1942, right. and we actually had differences between civil affairs, meant to be in liberated areas, and governance detachments that were meant to go to conquered areas, Japan and Germany, and be the governance, recognizing that when we got rid of their government, somebody was responsible for, some, for part of this. And I think, uh, I think MacArthur and the Army deserve a lot of credit for how they managed the occupations of Japan and Germany. Of course, we shared it in Germany. Japan, we had complete control, so a little more. But I think those are models for you know, stability operations, particularly in these post-war situations when you have unlimited objectives, meaning we deposed the government and basically de facto assumed control. The laws of war say when you conquer territory, you're responsible for the people on it. And I think that's where we had an awkward you know, a sense of what our responsibilities were in both Iraq and Afghanistan, as opposed to could we depose both governments and essentially assume control but didn't want to do it. And that was policy and, you know, at the operational level. And I think that compounded our problems, uh, trying to hand over government too quickly to unprepared entities that simply made it worse. I mean, there's a counterfactual. Should the United States have simply, and it was declared by the United Nations, the United Kingdom, the United States, powers occupying Iraq in May 2003, and that we should have occupied Iraq. We did, the CPA and some of these others, but w why not look more like Japan and Germany a few years before we turn it back over? Same thing in Afghanistan, potentially. Yeah, and the United States Army uh, gave up the argument, uh, in my mind, uh, in, in 03. And I'm saying this from a guy who's writing the Army history at that point. We wanted to have a, a te deum to the Army about what a brilliantly successful. And I get over there in May, and and the suction as people were trying to leave was pulling my shirt away from my body. 
Everybody was, man, let's go home and have the parade. We're out of here. But international law has, you have responsibilities, whether you like them or not. And we didn't take responsibility, in my mind, adequately. And in fairness to the Army officers that were struggling with that, including Bob Williams, you know, uh, you're, when you're dealing with Donald Rumsfeld, you know, you're in an unequal debate. But that's, that's how it's supposed to be. It's not ever supposed to be equal. And you don't get to give up just because the guy you're dealing with is unreasonable. So part of, part of my angst about, uh, about all of this is strategic choices matter, coming back to Bill Johnson's point, and we have obligations that we haven't always, uh, you know, it's not supposed to be an equal debate. You know, we work for the civilians, but we do have a point of view, and we need to be taking that point of view for the good of the country and not for the institution that we serve, which is the Army. I think sometimes we confuse that. I also would argue and add to what you, both of you have said is sometimes the Army's role is to be the hewers of wood and haulers of water. We are the logisticians for the joint force. And, you know, I, I don't want to see the Army become the, the hewers of wood and haulers of water for the U.S. JAR Corps, okay? But that, sometimes that's our role. And one of the things we don't like to do is we don't like to run theater, the theater logistics system. This division ran out of food and water at the end of the war. We culminated, to use old dead Carl's expression, because we didn't have any more water and we didn't have any more food. Now, God bless the logisticians, we didn't run out of bullets or fuel. But uh, one of the funniest things I've ever seen in my life is airdropping bottles of water to the, hundred, to, the, uh, to the Fighting First Division. You know, those things land like they came off a two-story building. And so the pallets of water was it made an impressive geyser, you know, of water everywhere. And birds for miles around flew in to suck it up. But it didn't do us any good. So then they had to land on a highway to give us water and food. We need to think about the, the trivial dull business of logistics. And if you do buy the book, I'm going to commend to you a picture in there of my battalion surgeon taking a soldier to a medevac bird while clamping his femoral artery. And he couldn't do anything with it in the field, so the femoral artery clamp had to be held all the way to the airplane. Then the guy on the airplane had to hold it all the way in. That kid is alive today. He'd have been dead in almost any other war in the United States. So those are some trivial things I wish I'd had more time to do which write more about the logistics fight. But if you want to read more about logistics, and I would ask you to think about this, so far, so fast, so many so far, so fast, the United States Transportation Command's history of the logistics movement of the, the deploying forces at the end of uh, Desert Storm. So you had to improvise at the railhead to get out in uh, 90. And after 91, during the drawdown, we were going to spend a lot of money on improving strategic logistics. More row row, the C-17, better railhead, more siding, more rolling stock. I've been retired a long time. How'd we do? Uh, we, did, we did a great job. Uh, if you go to Fort Riley, Kansas today, they can, I mean, I, they can load out about a nanosecond if they want to. They have lit, uh, uh, the place is lit. When we went, there were no lights, so you're loading in the dark with red flashlights and the rest of it. Uh, they've done a great job. But that was all done by the end of the 90s. So now it's been 18 years, so we need to look at that. When Gordon Sullivan was chief of staff, he also, for a short time, got to be secretary of the Army uh, because Mr. Shannon was you know, caught shoplifting. So now that he's secretary of the Army and chief of staff, the secretary of the Army, by the way, commands the Army, not the chief. The chief is the chief of staff, not the commander of the Army. But when he's Secretary of the Army, he can talk to the Navy Secretary, mano a mano, and say, you better build us 21 fast sea lift vessels, and he got it done. I think we've actually built 19. The, the youngest of those hulls is about 10 or 15 years, so they're good for another 10 or 15 years. But if you look at the rest of the Ready Reserve Fleet, some of the ships that broke down in Desert Storm and again in 03 are still in the fleet. So those are dull things. The Navy likes to build aircraft carriers and zoom waltz and such. But we need, some, we need good strategic lift. And the Air Force doesn't want to build more C-17s because, hey, Raptors are way cooler than C-17s. But if you care enough to go first class, you better build some you know, strategic airlift. I, not long ago, looked at the Civil Reserve Air Fleet. We're not in bad shape in the Civil Reserve Air Fleet except for one thing. What's the wide-body airplane of choice for cargo hauling? Well, that's not the 747 anymore. There's still some of them left, but they're going out of the inventory. So unless we buy some Antonov 124s from our good friends in Russia or buy the Airbus, whatever it is, we're going to be in, in trouble. 
So I'll dovetail off that. We just, in the last couple of weeks, through our ASAP program, had some speakers come through from Transcom and the like. A lot of uh, our centers, schools, posts throughout the Army are undergoing right now the transformation of being ready beyond just personnel readiness and equipment readiness. Um, as our chief in the last two, two and a half years has dictated that you will, at the behest of Transcom, get to your training center. So if you think you're going out of a certain place because you like it best and it happens to be Fort Stewart, they might change the idea and go out at some place else and use the rail at a nearby, another nearby state. So uh, I know a personal friend of mine in the 1st Infantry Division, the Deputy Commander, walks his rail line and reports to Transcom when it's not adequate. Yeah. Because uh, now it, it is about, we're back to, in the competition fight against China and Russia, we have to be ready to go expeditionary. You know, we got rid of all the uh, preposition stored equipment. Now they're bringing some of it back. So we need to get back to deployment exercises, uh, emergency deployment readiness exercises. In Fort Riley, every year we did a deployment exercise and everybody had to show up with their A and B bag and we'd load on a bus. They'd drive us to Forbes. Some people would get on an airplane and fly away. Everybody else would go back and you know get AAR. But you know, you, you can't do this if you aren't able if you don't practice it. It's it it's an inculcation of a cultural mindset. I if I may have to fight tonight. It's the green ramp thing in the eighty second airborne for everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for spending time with us today. I appreciate that. Um, uh, my interest in coming here was primarily about the transformation. I only spent three and a half years in the Army. It was all at, in the first ID from 76 to 79, so that trans the beginning of that transformation period. And uh, I think I was closer to the M1 Garand than the M1 Abrams. Um, uh, but uh, my... I have a couple of observations, and then I'd like to ask you a question. So I got out in 79, and at that time, public perception of the military was not at its highest point. The next time I really saw anything about the military was Desert Storm, and there had obviously been this tremendous transformation from the Army that I left in 79 to what was happening at Desert Storm um, in 91. So over that 12-year period, I'd be fascinated to know what your thoughts were about what caused that. I will say this, that in 79, yes, it was Volar. Yes, we had troops that were maybe not all there for the right reason. But it didn't matter what they were there for. If they were led properly, they were good soldiers. And I thought what I saw was there was, an ex there was um, a real difference. There were extremes of leadership in that 76 to 79 period. And perhaps that's what happened over that 12 years between then and 91, is that you got much better quality across the board of leadership. I mean, when I was, when I was at First ID, we, Gordon Sullivan was the, the, the G3, and, and um, Carl Bono was the ADC. You know, uh, Dan Whiteside, who lives about half an hour from here, was a G4. Um, you know, there were a lot of good people there, but I had a company commander. I walked in as a second lieutenant one day, and I said, I had a problem with the troop, and I asked him what the problem, you know, how do I deal with this? And he said, this is actual quote, did you ever wonder how a fly lands on the ceiling? I said, what? He said, does it fly up like this, and then just at the last it turns around, or does it just big this loop? And I'm, where is this guy coming from? You know? Seen dances with wolves. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, and uh, so I went from the extremes of, of the Gordon Sullivans and the Carl Bonos to, you know, to this guy. So that's my question. How did you get from 79 with this extreme of officer quality uh, to where you were, I assume, in 91 with a much more consistent caliber of leadership? I, I'd make the argument, and I, I glossed over this very quickly. It, it, he does cover it. Uh, the, the argument I would make is, is several fold. You were part of the bow wave of the new army. And I would make the argument, it's it seconded in this book, that in 77, 78, you started to see different soldiers coming into the army, both in the officer corps and in, in enlisted. We had this thing called the training revolution. 
in terms of task conditions and standard for the individual soldier. We had unit training requirements. We went to an Army training management system. You now had long-term non-commissioned officers who weren't turning over immediately and leaving in the post-Vietnam era. All of these things come together in one place. Each of these transformations would have been immense by themselves, but you've really got about 20 of them. Personnel changes. The idea that you we're not getting McNamara's 100,000 anymore. You have to have a high school education. We, we didn't make that requirement because of an, an intelligence requirement. It's because you had the ability to stick it through to high school. And the propensity, if, if you could finish high school, you'd finished an enlistment. And all of those things come together uh, in sort of a remarkable way uh, that gets quickly talked about here. Yeah, and I wish it had more time to talk about it because Bill's point's a great point. We also got tools that allowed us to get rid of the riffraff. So if you had somebody that wasn't ever going to be a good soldier, they gave us tools under 600, 200 that allowed us to let them go. Uh, often with, you know, an honorable or a general, I mean, without, you know, you, you didn't ruin their lives, but they were no, they just weren't suitable. Uh, you could get rid of them in training, and you could get rid of them relatively easy um, if you made the case. Uh, once they were uh, serving in the unit. That helped. I also think that training was a big part of it. You know, uh, Bob Killebrew is a guy I quote several times in, in, in the book because he was commanding right at the time that uh, the, t the 24th Division reflagged his first ID, which is where the book starts. And he, and he said in you know, one place, people forget how screwed up the Army was in 1971, 72, and 73. But he also said, well, you did. That the kids that he had, you know, some of them were coming home from, uh, they were draftees coming home from Vietnam. They had six months to do. They were happy to do their six months if they weren't abused and weren't, you know, and, and weren't fed, you know, uh, treated badly. So I, I would argue that the, the part of it was the things that Ulmer got to with training, you know, we'd have the CG invited a bunch of lieutenants down to his house when I was a second lieutenant. Say, hey, guys, what do I need to do to get, you know, to, you know, it was kind of a, it, it was, there was clearly a sense of commitment to the idea that the Army needed to do better at, at dealing with the soldiers that it had at the transition from the drafty Army uh, to uh, the regular Army or the professional Army. And I think that was an important thing. And I want to just throw one other thing out that's irrelevant to this story. I get to go down to Fort Riley quite frequently. And, and my bias, by the way, when I was asked to do this book is how do I write a book about the unit I served in? And one of the struggles for me was trying to tell the story warts and all because, you know, oddly as it may seem to those of us that served in the First Division, we weren't always perfect. Um, mostly we were perfect, but not always. The soldiers that are in the Army now, these the millennials that everybody wants to talk about, they're fine kids. They're okay. Uh, they're just different than we were. So uh, advertisement for the current crop of American soldiers. If I could say just one thing real quick, dude. As a recipient of, the, of what others did to create the Army that I got to, to get into, but I got a lot of it secondhand, and the people I got it from was the non-commissioned officers. And yeah, yeah. when I got to, and, and I'll just as a vignette, I mean, I got to the 82nd Airborne Division, the, the NCOs there, many of them were there at Vietnam, they were at the tail end of the soldiers, and they stuck around. The ones who stuck it out, made it through with the drug testing and the indiscipline and, and pushed through, were incredible leaders. And, and I'll give you one vignette, there was a Master Sergeant Sexton. He'd been a major in the Vietnam War. He'd actually been a staff sergeant who became a major. And then when the rift hit, he went back to being a staff sergeant. And so now he was junior to the NCOs he'd been peered with, he had been his peers. He stuck it out. He cared about the Army that much. And it was these folks. And it was interesting to watch, because secondhand, knowing this story, officers often didn't trust the NCOs. And so it was partly one of the things that a lot of the junior folks is we got to, you could trust the NCOs. We had to help the senior officers recognize they could trust the NCOs again. But when I think back, I mean, I've seen a professional NCO Corps my entire career from the day I entered West Point in 1980 until, and particularly as a lieutenant in, 80, in 85. I received that NCO Corps from somebody else. But I, when I look at where the professionalization and where the, where the turn came, I still go back to that touchstone as being crucial. I'll, another short brief, and yet the very first day in my unit, I was asked to bring Staff Sergeant Morales to the company commander's office. Sergeant Morales and I went to his office, and the Honolulu Police Department slapped handcuffs on him and took him away. 
because he'd been caught for multiple breaking and entering. Uh, and he was considered one of the better squad leaders in that company. What year was that? 1975. Look at the yeah. You have to look at the quality of the officers and the quality of the NCOs. Professional military education, both for officers and NCOs, central command selection. Yeah, mm. That's a biggie. Look, a big it's not, it doesn't matter who you know anymore. you got to compete against your peers, and you have to know what the hell you're doing. If you're going to take a division and fight it in the desert, you... That is not rookie amateur sport. Being a battalion commander of 58 tanks that can kill at 2,000 meters with accuracy is not amateur sport. These guys have to know what the hell they're doing. And what happened in the Army under guys like DePew and, and, um, and Paul Gorman and those kind of guys, Gordon Sullivan, Carl Bono is probably the better of them all, is he said, I want you to train to standard. I want a trained and ready army to standard. He knew what standards were because that's where we were told to go to. And the quality of your officer corps and your quality of your NCO corps grew. And it hasn't, it, the only thing that's changed since Desert Storm is they're better than we are. Mm. Why are they better than they are? Because they went to school on us and now they have better technology and they think faster than we do. It's hard to even play bridge with them anymore because they think <laughs> faster than we do. You know what I mean? But the quality of the leader has really accelerated. And let me tell you something else. The soldiers were a part of making us that good because the soldiers get out, can think as fast as you can today. They get the technology quicker than some of the leaders do today. But it, it's an exciting time to have been a part of the Army. And I don't know if this is something that continued on, but when I was uh, at Fort Riley, they had something called LLMDC, Leadership Management Development Course. And it was race, it, it was HR type stuff, but it's, it served me throughout my whole civilian career in management. I mean, the things that taught me as a, as a young officer about um, how, to, how to lead people, I mean, different cultural differences. Somebody mentioned, you know, race relations and things like that. I mean, it was the simple things like, Hey, when you're talking to a Hispanic and, you, and you're, you're um, uh, correcting him on something, he'll, he'll be looking down because that's what culturally he's taught to do when you're being corrected. And what oftentimes an officer would say, look me, I want you to look me in the eyes. I want you to look me in the eyes. Well, that's not what the culture was. And we were taught a lot of things like that that really served me well. Um, and, and maybe that sort of thing continued on after I got out. I don't know. Uh, you know, more of the how do you treat people, how do, how do you lead people type thing. So. Uh, yes, I'd like to ask, uh, oh, first I'd like to thank all of the uh, speakers for a very, uh, very enlightening and interesting discussion. During Desert Storm, the rest of the world was watching. Um, and the rest of the world, and particularly uh, adver potential adversaries like, uh, well, Soviet Union at that time, but uh, Russia today, the Russian military today, and China, uh, derived some lessons uh, from that. And um, what do you think is... Uh, the, the necessity for the Army and for the other services in institutional reform to prepare for the next potential, uh, uh, and, I, and I'm hoping it's, uh, or we can all hope it's potential, um, adversarial conflict with, uh, uh, with a hostile force that has derived lessons uh, in joint force uh, operations. I'll take a shot. Uh from the perspective of uh, trying to understand what the Russians might have learned uh, from Desert Storm, I looked at two sources. 
that led me to a particular way when I did the Army's history of the invasion in 03. And uh, the Russians described air land battle, and they've continued to, to reform their view, but, but essentially as an attempt to have contactless fight, where you're killing your enemy at, at long ranges. All the hype about precision munitions and the long range uh, hellfire uh, anti-tank missile tank guns that could, you know, 15 to 3,000 meters accurately, assuming you weren't shooting at friendlies. But the most interesting assessment I read was by the Indians. Uh, the Indians of the subcontinent, not my ancestors, the Choctaw. But the subcontinent des described what we were trying to do as, again, precision attack with low risk. And so they made an argument of what you should invest in. And if you read what they, it's Lancer's papers number six, it's easy to find. It says you got to look at energy weapons, you have to look at improved air defenses, you have to look at uh, long range sensors, buy in satellites, that kind of business. And if you look at what the other guys are doing out there, they're doing those things. Uh, the Russians explicitly and specifically now have done through several iterations, and there's a guy named Gerasimov that everybody says, hey, Gerasimov's new way of warfare. Gerasimov is describing in the new way of warfare what he thinks we were doing, which is about attacking in multiple domains simultaneously, air, land, sea, cyber, all of that simultaneously. So, so to get ready for that, we have to, first of all, understand uh, rule number one is nobody fights symmetrically. I, I hate people talking about symmetrical warfare, or asymmetrical warfare. Nobody ever, you know, it's like asking, who, who, who started a war to lose it? Nobody does that. So, so you're talking about asymmetry from the get-go, uh, and that means have more of your stuff than they do, attack them some way they don't expect. But it's all about asymmetry in, in every, each and every case. So the Russians are looking at us and saying, hey, what I don't want to do is deal with these guys in a symmetrical way. I don't want to fight them in the open plains of Europe. So they're doing long-range weapons. They're buying the, the S-300, S-400, very long-range air defense, 300 kilometers or so, you know, in the unclass mode. And they're building the capability to, to find our, our stuff. If, uh, if, if a stealth airplane has the, uh, a radar blip the size of a Sparrow, and the Sparrow's going, you know, 700 miles an hour at 35,000 feet, what do you think it is? It's probably not a sparrow, you know? There are ways that they can, they can overbalance what we do. Uh, the U.S. Army was slow to pick up on that. When I was commander of BCTP in 99, when I re retired from the Army, there were 65 countries that were employing UAVs. The United States Army wasn't one of them. Uh, now we have UAVs. There's clouds of them over every unit, but we haven't figured out how to run the airspace. Long answer to a short question, but the bo bottom line is this. We cannot, we are the guys that others emulate right now. So we have to look at that from their perspective. If you're going to fight the gringos, what do you have to have? And then the gringos need to think, what are the counters to that? I just add one last point on that, too, is I think, and they have, the Chinese and the Russians that really went to school on Desert Storm. Yes, they did. Spent a lot of time trying to figure out what that means. Now, and I don't have the exact answer for all things they're coming up with. We're working on, we're mindful of different things. But the thing that I'm most heartened by goes back to the last slide you had where it's really about the people. It's not our equipment that made the difference. It's our people and the systems we've put together, our education, our training. The Chinese and the Russians do not have NCO corps as capable as ours. They don't have junior officers with the same sort of education, talent, and ability to act on their own. In that regard, uh, and, and probably not a surprise, I'm here in professional military education. I care deeply about this, but I think this is one of our great comparative advantages. It's, it's true of our entire education system. That's why so many internationals come to us. And the Chinese, frankly, send a lot of their students here because they, they are probably the ones who've caught on most to the real way to counter us is they need the human capital to help match that. They're the ones I'd be more concerned about as a competitor than the Russians, because they've kind of figured out that part. They're trying to professionalize their military, because they've recognized it isn't the equipment. I think it's a really hard effort for them to do that. We've got tremendous advantages in how we develop our people. That's, to me, where we maintain you know, our, our edge. And I'm less worried. So I'm very heartened by the way we approach this, the fact that we even talk about a successful event like Desert Shield or Storm, and still talk about the things that we didn't do as well as we should, the issues of fratricide, the issues of indiscipline, the issues that we can talk about openly. Talking about Milai yesterday in the Pentagon, for goodness sakes, 
what institution spends that much time looking in the mirror, doing the after action reviews, not just on the tactical, but at all levels, so that we can be better. Our human capital is what that yields in ways that I think that those adversaries, any adversaries, as we challenge, our allies are the closest to it, and that's because they recognize that we are kindred spirits, and that's an advantage too. So I'd add one more thing to that. So I think the, the, uh, the Russians are very good at this. Grasimov loves it, and, uh, and the Chinese are doing it too. They compete to a point to below the level of warfare. No, nobody wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Mike Tyson. We're Mike Tyson. So what they do is on everything, they take it all the way to a place where we're, we don't have the political will to do something about it. They poison a young lady in Britain with a chemical we know is only came from Russia and no one's doing anything about it. It's that over and over and over again. It's in the cyber realm. It's in the space realm. It's on the land. Look at the Ukrainian space study. It's... They went all the way to the point where we we're going to just slap the table and take NATO into the fight, and the, well, okay. that's enough. That's the difference to their approach right now. I think it's uh, it's both frightening, but in, a, in, in one sense, it's very powerful. That nobody wants to fa face us that way. Get to your last, I think, your point. I, I'm going pretty far afield here. Um, if we are engaged in a major conflict, with a major regional power of some form or another. Uh, we've got to do something to build the resiliency of the American public. We've lost a little over 2,000 people in Afghanistan. Uh, we have the potential for conflicts where we'll, use, we'll lose that in hours. And how are we as a, as a nation going to have the military resiliency to continue to feed the force into the fight and then how do we build the resiliency inside the population to withstand that, as well as some of the deprivations that are going to come? Brian's point about Russian cyber attacks. I don't know if you've been following it in the news, but you know, they're just about everywhere. <laughs>